seats of old ones, you know. That's what they ought to do. They ought to have the room open and just play one of my old videos. Or watch a video from another class that I teach, you know, see if it looks interesting. Or, I don't know, watch cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> Always, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, so no class on Thursday. Um, your project, that would be a good time if you have not already started thinking about, to start thinking about your project and review the design documents and, and, and possibly begin it or even, you know, make progress on it. Um, what do those letters stand for? I say, no, this is not a trick question. It stands for work. First W is the focus, World Wide Web. Notice that it is not the Microsoft, the Apple Wide Web, the Android Wide Web, the United States Wide Web, and so on. It's the World Wide Web. Right from the beginning, the assumption was that it ought to be universal. All right? It ought to be able to, people ought to be able to connect to the World Wide Web and access documents as long as they had a device that followed a few simple, a few sets of rules. What are those rules called, by the way? Protocols, exactly. Um, so the, the main, couple of main protocols, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. In other words, no, your device has to know how to ask for a web page, and it has to know what, you know, how to get back a web page. Uh, the other one is IP protocol. It has to follow the protocol of having an IP address and, and having it done in a consistent manner so that other machines can find your machine when you make a request, so it can find it back. So, yeah, as long as you follow these rules, as long as you have a, a software that conforms to these protocols, you ought to be able to access the web. And that's really the power of it. Um, and people can do some, some cool things exploiting the power of this, right? This is why there's not a different web for mobile devices than there is for laptops and desktops. Hey, just make the mobile device conform to those protocols and you're good to go. But it even gets beyond that. You can have, um, you can control the lights of a building via a web browser interface. As long as the controller that controls the lighting follows those protocols. All right, um, and so on, you know. So right from the start, the whole assumption was that anyone should be able to access it. So that's why we focus on a lot of things in this class to accommodate different devices, different browsers, and so on. We talked about doing mobile web development and some of the things that we do for that. We talked about browser compatibility. We talked about using fluid grids where we can, when we resize things, it looks good on different size screens and so on. There's one important factor, though, that people often forget about. All right? And I don't even think our textbook covers it very well. And that's why I, I have sort of a unit of my own that I, I talk about that. And that is that the people that are connected to these machines vary in many respects. All right? And we want to write web pages that accommodate the people and the differences between people. Specifically, people of different abilities, people that have certain disabilities. And for many people, um, 
the idea that pops in their head instantly is talking about people that are blind, right? Because the web is such a visual medium that when we talk about people with disabilities and how they're affected uh, in accessing the web, of course we're going to think about blindness, all right? So a lot of people sort of shortchange web accessibility and think it just means creating websites for blind people. And what does that mean? Well, that means including all attributes on your images. That's one of the things that you can do, all right? And, and so on and so forth. And because of this, I think the topic gets shortchanged, all right? Really, there's a lot of disabilities, a lot of different disabilities that affect a user's ability to access a web page, a website. In addition to the disabilities, there's sort of variations of these disabilities that affect people as well. So when we start considering the whole picture, we're going to realize that more people are affected, more people have disabilities or variations of disabilities than we might originally think of if we just consider people that are blind. In addition, we're going to see where there are certain circumstances where things that we do for people with disabilities can benefit even people that don't have disabilities. All right? that the, the notion of that is a notion sometimes called universal design. So we're building a site that is good for everyone, people without disabilities and people with disabilities. Before we get into some things to, to, that we can do, and we're going to talk about some very general things, some very general concepts and, 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 um, and, and philosophies for approaching accessibility, and then we're going to talk about some specific items. Let's try to detail a list of different disabilities that would affect a person in accessing the web. Can anyone name one? All right, illiteracy. All right. All right. So, illiteracy, and even along with that, and again, what would be a milder case of illiteracy? Well, possibly, or we could give it its own category. I'm talking about people that have limited reading ability. You know, maybe they only read on a fifth or sixth grade level. All right? So, um, we could, dyslexia really doesn't sort of belong here, but in a way it does. I guess it depends on how you categorize it. I'll put that down as a separate one. Associated with illiteracy would be um, people with limited reading abilities. Cognitive issues. What's another one? All right. Uh, we'll include that, although that's not really a disability. I wouldn't call someone that speaks French disabled <laughs> as opposed to English, all right? But that is a potential barrier, all right? That is a potential barrier. And we can, we can, we can consider what we can do for these folks even if we don't classify it as a disability, all right? Watch, I'll have, I'll have hundreds of angry YouTube comments on this video. Yeah, I was going to say, and they'll be all in French, so I won't understand them, so it won't really matter. I'll only understand what my two years of high school French taught me, which, yeah, is sacre bleu and, and zunes. No, zunes is old English, right? Merde, all right? Right, <laughs> je m'appelle, yeah. All right, what, what's another example? A lot of physical, like, what would be an example? Okay. Uh, call these uh, 
computer issues. In other words, um, things such as, you know, amputees. All right, let's let's hold on to that. Um, what would uh, what would be also in this category? I think someone should be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the chronic tendonitis. Um, carpal tunnel. Which one? Arthritis. We could add into this uh, something like Parkinson's disease, where your hands shake. So anything that affects your ability to like move your hand around, all right, would be uh, an example of that. All right, so amputee or, or paraplegic. Um, if you're in a wheelchair, that doesn't necessarily constitute a disability that is problematic accessing the web, but if you have problems with your upper body and your hands and arms, that, that could be. What's another example? Someone said it before. Epilepsy. And what is the, what is the, what is relevant for web pages with epilepsy? Right. Flashing, screens, Certain animations can trigger seizures. Other disabilities. ADD? ADD or ADHD? Be another example. How would that affect someone's ability to access the web? Be, yeah, be, be easily distracted. Now, again, when we talk about disabilities and we talk about how there are disabilities, then there are sort of like related conditions, all right, or there may not even be related conditions, but even people that you wouldn't characterize as disability. How many of you have ever been distracted on a website? Yeah, everyone, right? You, you go off, you know, I'm going to look up, I'm going to look up uh, something for my iOS development class, all right? Next thing I know, I'm on a web page looking at recipes for, for spaghetti and meatballs, you know? I mean, it happens. That's a, sort of a characteristic of the web. Is, and that's why they call it a web. You get entwined in it, and you get, um, you can easily get distracted to put in there. So, I wouldn't characterize myself as having ADHD, and again, not necessarily, um, you know, everyone has ADHD, but there is the potential to be distracted on the web. And in fact, um, when we did the example of good websites and bad sites, most of the bad websites people pointed out were websites that had way too much stuff going on, all right, where it's difficult to focus. And again, that can be problematic for anyone regardless of their abilities or disabilities, but it's especially problematic for someone that has ADHD. Anything else? Anxiety and panic. That's a good, that's a good one. I'm certainly open to considering it. How, what were you thinking? Okay. Okay. No, not necessarily. Um, what I see a lot, for example, if you look on, on Tumblr, is they'll put what they call trigger warnings. 
you know, yeah. And again, sometimes on Tumblr that, that's taken to the nth degree, and I'm not going to debate that. But you could, for example, on a news site, if you had a video of some accident or something, you could say that this video is, is yeah, is graphic, uh, you know. So, so you, could, you could put some sort of warning on it. So yeah, we, we, can, we can count that. And again, you know, there may be other people that wouldn't identify themselves as having panic disorder or anxiety. They're just especially sensitive or maybe sensitive to certain sort of things, you know. And, and therefore, um, therefore um, you know, to, to warn it would be good. What will be another example. You guys are coming up with some good ones. But we are missing some of the obvious ones. <laughs> yeah, blind, yeah. Well, we'll put blindness. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, my, uh, my music professor said, my music professor said, uh, music appreciation professor said, one of his teachers, composers, said, never strain to avoid the obvious. So don't avoid the obvious, right? And you mentioned color blindness, and I'll put blindness, which I mentioned before, a lesser degree of, of which you could call as any other vision issues. And that would include color blindness. What else would that include? Just bad eyes, all right? I mean, I'm not blind. I'm not colorblind, but I got bad eyes. Just plain and simple. So there's a lot of times where I have a hard time reading the screen or, or whatever. Anything else? What's another obvious one? Yeah, hearing. And what would be a milder form of hearing, uh, of someone being deaf, completely deaf? Just someone that has bad ears, you know, bad ears, hard, a little bit hard of hearing. All right. Now, interesting thing is, is if you look at some of these, all right, I can be a testimony to this. All right, as you get older, you start having sort of a little potpourri of some of these symptoms, right? I only have some arthritis, I know that. I, I don't have motor control issues, I don't have Parkinson's or carpal tunnel and all that, but I do have some arthritis and it's harder for me to move the mouse around than it, than it used to be. I'm not blind, but I don't have particularly good eyes. I'm not deaf, but I don't have particularly good hearing. So you can sort of lump all of these into what we can call age-related conditions. And age-related conditions is sort of a mix of many of these symptoms. All right. Now, let's talk about hearing. <laughs> Could have figured that on that one, huh? We'll, well, we'll save that one. We'll, we'll save that one for, for a while. I was going to I was going to ask a question, but we'll we'll save that for a while. There might be others. I think we've hit most of the major ones by now. I'm trying to, trying to identify anything big that we missed. We have sort of the cognitive disabilities, which would include reading problems, dyslexia, ADHD, um, vision-related, hearing-related, motor-related. That's probably most of them, all right? And I think we've identified that these all exist sort of in their most severe forms, whereas like actually a medical diagnosis, all right, 
And they exist sort of in milder forms where, yeah, the person isn't deaf, but they don't hear very well. Yeah, the person isn't blind, but, and so on. All right. Now, we're going to follow two principles in addressing these needs. And the interesting thing is, is what I'm trying, uh, one, of my, one of my main points in doing this is these two principles are going to be beneficial if we follow these two principles, it will be beneficial not just for people with disabilities, but it will be beneficial for even people that don't have disabilities. Or, at the worst, it won't bother them. It won't affect them. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I could develop a, an accessible website, but that would diminish the experience of people that don't have disabilities. And that's a myth in my mind. If you follow the principles of good accessible web design, it's just taking the, the principles of good web design and just refining them a bit. So by making your website accessible, you're also going to make it better for everyone accessing it. And the two principles are simplicity and presentation. Now, they may seem to contradict each other, right? By multiple presentation, I mean showing the same information more than one different way. All right? Um, a, a, a example of that would be if you have text and an image for something. All right? A text along with an image might help someone that is dyslexic identify what you're talking about. It might help someone who's a poor reader, all right, and so on down the line, all right. So that's what I mean by multiple presentations. And you might say that, well, that's making it less simple because you're taking the same piece of information and you're showing it two different ways. And I guess I'd say, in a way, you're right, all right. Design is sort of balancing and finding the sweet spot between making something simple and making it complex, all right? We could make a website simple where it just had like a sentence every page, all right? That would be simple, but that brings its own issues uh, uh, to play in there. That, you know, that makes it complicated to navigate around, all right? So the idea is, is when you're designing pages to find that right balance between the simplicity and the complexity. So in other words, Maybe show an image along with text, but you don't need to show image, text, audio file, video file, animation. That's overkill. All right, so you'll find the sweet spot between these two. All right, let's look down these. Let's look at simplicity, first of all. All right, and then we'll go back and we'll look at multiple presentation, and we'll see how they affect these different disabilities. There's probably a third one here. User configurability, if that's a word. I was thinking, I was thinking of what to say as I was writing, and that's the best I came up with. Example, if you can pick your color scheme on a page, that's bound to help people, right? It's going to, it's going to help people that are colorblind, for sure. It's going to help people that maybe have other vision uh, problems, because they can pick a color scheme that is easiest for them to read. All right. Simplicity. What can we do regarding simplicity that will help people that are illiterate or, if not illiterate, have difficulty reading? Pardon me? Okay. Well, okay, let's actually consider both of them, simplicity and multiple presentations at the same time. Having images along with the text would be an example of multiple presentation. They can look, look at the image, yeah. Or depending on the specific thing, you could have 
text along with a video file, right? You know, like with a news story. You could have the text of the news story and the video of the news story. Why not just have the video of the news story? Could be other issues with other people, could be hearing issues, for one, all right. Um, and in addition, there's some times where I don't want to sit through a five-minute video. I can read pretty fast, all right, and I can at least skim the text to see if it's something I'm interested enough in to watch the video. So like if there is a, 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 sto a news story on a news site and there's a video for it, I can look and say, well, let me read through this, and uh, that's boring, I don't need to hear that. Or, yeah, that's interesting, I'll go and watch that. But I can do that skimming without having to click on and watch the video. Now, here's sort of a, a, a side quest here, all right? Why do you think some places might put videos only on a page and not videos and text? Because I see that on a lot of news sites. They make you watch a video. Why would they want to make you watch the video? So you see the advertisement, right? Yeah, so, so exactly. So um, they may want to make you watch the video for that reason, which is, you know, I suppose it's worth bringing up because, I mean, that is a consideration in the real world. But from purely a theoretical web design perspective, it would be better to have text along with the video because people that are deaf can read it. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, how do I want to say? Um, the technology for the web evolved faster than people figuring out how to make money from it. So people tried a lot of approaches to figure out how to make money from it, and that, that was one of them, is to, you know, okay, we'll, we'll show you part of the story and... Yeah, yeah, I know, and I know, and it, 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 it yeah, that's, that's pretty annoying. So that's multiple presentation for illiteracy. We could have a video or a photo along with the text. So that would help the person that, if not fully, you know, if not fully illiterate, at least they could, they could, um, you know, um, see the video instead of that. Again, we wouldn't want overkill. We wouldn't necessarily want an animation, a video, and all that, but would want to find the sweet spot that's appropriate. How would simplicity help people that have trouble reading? Less is more. All right. Pardon me? Use simple language. All right. All right. Uh, again, there's a, there's, a, there's a quote by Einstein, all right, that says something to the effect that things ought to be as simple as they can be, but things ought to be made as simple as they can be, but no simpler. In other words, you don't want to, quote, dumb down the content. That being said, there's sort of an art to writing for the web that expresses things in the most direct, simple way as possible. It's like the old expression, never use a big word when a diminutive one would suffice. Right? You know, you don't wanna you don't wanna do something like that. You wanna phrase things as simple as straightforward. Write so that people can scan as opposed to reading it. Web pages aren't read typically the same way that a book or a newspaper is read. So bulleted points instead of long narratives. That's not to say there aren't places or there are not topics for a long article on the web, but you pick and choose the places and use it where appropriate. All right. If I was doing a news site, I probably would. Uh, if I was doing a, a, a news site and I had a news story, I probably would have a headline that explained it, maybe three or four bullet points that um, summarizes it, and then I'd have the article. And that's an example of multiple presentation, and that was that's good for people that have trouble reading because then they can pick up maybe the main 
ideas. But it's also good for everyone else because sometimes you're in a hurry and you just want the gist of the information. Or other times you might really be interested in it and you can drill down and get the more information. That's really one thing the web does better than media that happened before it is the ability to drill down and the ability to read something to the, to the depth that you are interested in it with hyperlinks and the way that you construct your pages. Typically a book is just a block of text, right? It's pretty hard to, I guess you could, you know, you, there's things you can do in a book to maybe simplify it a little bit. You know, you have chapter headings and section headings and all that. But pretty much a book you read in a linear fashion from beginning to end. Whereas with the web, by choosing what links you click on, by choosing what part of the page you read and scan and all that, you can sort of read it to the level of detail that you're interested. So, in that case, both simplicity and multiple presentations benefits both people that are, have a hard time reading and other people. All right? I can skim the article if I'm not interested in it. I can read as well as anyone, but I don't want to spend my time reading this article. If I can skim it and get the gist of it, that might be sufficient. Or, I'm really interested in this, so I'll watch the video. Or, I'm blind and don't like to read or don't like the screen reader, so I'll listen to the video. All right? Dyslexia. What can we do for people with dyslexia in terms of simplicity or multiple presentations? Effective use of white space. All right? Spacing between text, between lines, and so on. Don't have a so gigantic solid block of text. G, who else does that benefit? Well, that benefits people that have a hard time reading. All right. That benefits people that don't have the best eyesight. And really, is there anyone that's going to say, no, I prefer a solid block of text the size of my screen in, you know, 8 pixel font. All right? No. All right, so pretty much everyone that's going to benefit everyone to have proper spacing. It's going to make your site look better. It's going to make your site more functional. Functional. So that's a case of simplicity benefiting people that are dyslexic, but also benefiting people that um, are not. What else could we do? Either simplicity or multiple presentation. Using different fonts. Specifically, you right. We would use clear, straightforward fonts. All right. Again, most of the time, that's preferable anyhow. A lot of these decorative fonts, again, when, I was, when we talked about this, I, I think I reviewed this, sort of have a look of, of an amateurish look anyhow. So avoid them. All right. Pick fonts that are most clear to read. What did we decide about? clarity in fonts. We said for larger letters, serif fonts are preferred. For smaller letters, sans serif fonts all right, are, are typically used. But don't use exotic fonts that are difficult to read. Now again, is anyone that doesn't have dyslexia apt to complain about that? Repeat that, please. Um, yeah, I, well, well I, I'll agree with the second part, but I'll disagree with the first part. There are some fonts that are simply harder for people with dyslexia to read. Just flat out. All right? You, you don't think so? You don't think there are some fonts that are harder for people with dyslexia to read and some fonts that are easier? Right, right. Let's, let's look up. Let's see if Google has an opinion on the matter. Right.
designers found this electric reader like good A senders and D senders. B and D, P and Q distinguished, not mirror images, which is just the opposite of the font they use here because the P and Q and the B and D are mirror images. Different forms for capital I, lowercase l, and the digit 1. Yeah. Letter spacing, again, to your point. All right. Only a few people. So it may not be a burning issue. Again, this, some love Comic Sans, but some didn't. All right. found that reading was significantly impaired when italics were used. Right. All right. So, to your point, The spacing is important and, and is critical, but I also think choosing a clear font is good as well. All right. I mean, I'm sure we could find fonts, you know, that are, as as was mentioned, there are some fonts that are simply harder for anyone to read, and I would think that would be compounded when you talk about people with dyslexia. All right. Um. What can we do as far as multiple presentation goes? Pardon me? For dyslexia. Sort of the same thing for people that just have difficulty reading, right? We could include a video or images um, along with the text. So multiple presentation again comes in handy. All right? And as I mentioned before, there are times that regardless of disabilities, you may want to read the text or view the video. All right. Language issue. All right. Not really a disability, but what can we do for those folks? Google Translate. All right. Simpler words. Keep it simple. Multiple presentations. Photographs along with... Um, along with text. The last one is important, user configurability. If you know that a substantial part of your audience is going to speak a different language than the main language of the site, you know, in our case assuming it to be English, but if you know you're going to have a high proportion of Spanish speaking, French speaking, whatever folks, then consider having a link that will take them to a page that will have, um, like the flags, yeah. Uh, and many, many sort of international companies, you'll see that, you know. Um, theoretically, we can talk about the best way to design these pages, but in practice, something like this especially could potentially be expensive to develop, all right? So you would look at the individual case. Do I think there would be a lot of people that are accessing it that would speak another language? If so, then have an alternative. If I didn't think there were a lot of people, then... And it might depend on the location. If I was, for example, a Texas or a Southern California company, I might use, be more apt to use Spanish, as a, have a Spanish version of my site than if I was in Minnesota, let's say. All right. Motor issues. What can we do for those folks, either with regards to multiple presentation or simplicity? Larger links, yeah. Larger buttons. Don't make it so tiny that they have a hard time pointing it. Right. Right. Yeah, limit some of the hover effects. 
is, is definitely something. Right. Okay. Uh, limit the amount of scrolling. All right. Um, if not, limit the amount of scrolling. Be cognizant of, of it and put the most important stuff on, on top. You know. Um, that is kind of hard because you don't know what size the screen is. So I could limit scrolling on this monitor. I bring up on a phone, I'd still have to scroll. But if you sort of prioritize information, then, then that would be beneficial. Yeah. What else could we do? Pardon me? Eliminate left and right scrolling. And what have we learned CSS-wise that could be useful here? Float and using percentages for widths as opposed to, um, as opposed to um, absolute, absolute pixel sizes. One thing that we have not talked about yet, but you can do, is you can provide keyboard shortcuts to certain things. Because for some people, working the keyboard is easier than working the mouse. All right? So that would be another possibility. Epilepsy. What can we do for folks with epilepsy? No flashing. Yeah, no flaming logos, no spinning tires. No. Now, who, regardless of whether they have epilepsy or not, is going to be bothered much by that? Yeah, no one is going to be bothered. Everyone is going to like, it. yeah, I would say it depends on how you ask the question, I forget. That's something that will benefit everyone. That's the case of simplicity. Chances are those kind of things that are problematic to someone with epilepsy won't necessarily trigger a seizure in someone that doesn't have epilepsy, but it's going to irritate the heck out of them, all right? And it's just annoying. And it has the potential to be distracting. So, if it doesn't add value, if it's purely decoration, get rid of it. All right? If it is something that's important, all right, we are simulating, you know, we're a, a website and we are simulating um, the blast off of a rocket or something. I don't know where the flames come out and all that. What would you do? Well, you'd put it in a way where you would say, here's a link to this, warning, this could, and give the person a choice to see it. And maybe show photographs for it if for someone that does have epilepsy. So they won't necessarily see the animation, but they might see the individual uh, photographs of it. So again, multiple presentation and simplicity. ADHD. We're, we're repeating the sort of the same things over and over again, right? ADHD, we won't want to distract people. So what do we do? We use simple language. All right? We use good spacing. We don't cram everything together. We get rid of gratuitous elements like unnecessary images, animation, things along those lines. And again, that benefits everyone because it allows people to focus on everything else. The one mistake that a lot of people make in web design is they take the approach that if five things on a page are good, then ten things on a page must be great. And then fifteen is better still, and so on. What's wrong with that is they don't realize that all content isn't equal. There's definitely content that's more important than others. And by putting extra stuff on a page, you run the risk of distracting people from the stuff that's important. Yes? Important, interesting, and simple. And, and again, yeah, that, that would be good for ADHD, but that's also probably pretty good guidelines for keeping anyone on the site. Anxiety, uh, panic related, we sort of talked about that already, where it's almost like epilepsy, where you could put warnings on the content and maybe have alternate content for someone that didn't want to see a video that could disturb someone that was sensitive or whatever. 
blindness. Ex all right. And, yeah. Well, keep in mind. Yeah, keep in mind that we've we've not talked about so far um, the notion of assistive technology. Assistive technology is where people have some combination of hardware or software that they use that helps them access the site. So for example, there's a screen narrator. And I'm going to try it here. The, one, the default one with Windows is not particularly good. But there are people, there, there are like better ones that you can purchase. Um, I'm looking for accessibility options, ease of access center. Here's a narrator. What? desktop backslash all control panel items backslash e set up high contrast button start magnifier button Lorraine County Community College home Go location bar desktop backslash all control panel items backslash start on screen keyboard button set up high contrast button it, it's reading both of these screens to me at the same time because I Start clicked on that and button. reading this one. Microsoft Narrator with contains Narrator will read aloud what is on screen as you navigate using the keyboard. Location bar. Desk. Tab. Lorraine County Community College. Home. Google Chrome Window. Tab. Location bar. Desktop backslash all control panel items backslash tab. Set up high contrast button. Tab. All right. We can see a couple Start things magnifier about this. button. Exit One. narrator window. Focus on yes. Yeah, button. I, I'm not an expert Contains in, in yes using button. that. And no button. It's still talking. Are you sure you want to exit narrator? Right. Um, obviously, that's no one's choice to access the site that way. Right. But if you're blind, what other option do you have? All right. So. Having text along with images, having alt text, having text um, that describes an image or even a description property, all these things allow you to give a multiple presentation so someone that is blind can access it. Um, you said turn off the display? Absolutely. When I, uh, I did a fellowship at NASA, uh, I worked uh, in the same office as a blind student. I would come in the morning, she would be sitting there typing on her keyboard with the screen off. All right, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it, it sort of took me aback the first few times because it's like, it just looks like someone is pretending to be typing, you know? <laughs> when actually, you know, she was doing stuff and she did everything that you would expect a high school student to be able to do, make PowerPoint, instant message her friends instead of working. Uh, I mean, anything that, that you would think would be typical. Uh, from time to time, if she got stuck with something, she would ask me to come over and, and tell her what was on the screen. Because every once in a while, kind of like with that narrator, um, you know, she had a better application for it, so she didn't get caught and confused as often as we did. Plus, she knew how to use it uh, better than I know how to use narrator. But again, every once in a while, you get sort of confused and, you know, you sh should need a hand sorting it out. But... It's amazing, you know, what people can do with that. Um, provided you develop your site in a way that doesn't screw up their, their um, assistive technology. What's one way that you could screw up screen reader assistive technology? This is a classic one that was, this is a classic, say, 2000, year 2000, not Y2K, but year 2000, year 1999 web development technique. Use a 
use for a link a image that has a word on it. All right? Text reader can read text. Text reader can't look at an image and figure out the word that's set on it. So if you're aware of these things and, you know, you can, you can play well along with the assistive technology. All right? Whereas if you're not aware of these things, um, you, can, you can break it. Um, again, as a reminder, we don't have class on Thursday. On next, Mon uh, next Tuesday, all right, next, next Monday, you'll be doing something else, right? And I'll be doing something else. Yeah, but next Tuesday, we'll wrap this up and then go on to the next topic, whatever that may be. I don't remember off the top of my head. All right, <laughs> all right we'll see you in lab.